And we are so excited to see you all. But we're not here about us. We're not here about you. We're here about the gospel. And so we're going to go straight to our lesson tonight because it is incredibly powerful to think about what the gospel can do. It's incredible to think about what the gospel has done throughout the ages. It's incredible to think about what the gospel has done here at this church. It's incredible to think about what the gospel has done in your own life and in your family's life. But in order for us to really see the power of the gospel tonight, I hope that we'll look back to the gospel of Romans. There in Romans chapter 1 and verse 1, our text for this evening, we're going to be studying what the gospel can do. And then we're going to look at some applications about how we need to live because of what the gospel has done. But we begin there in verse 1, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 1, the Bible begins with this wonderful word, Paul. Now you know who Paul is, don't you? He is that guy that we met all the way back in the beginning of Acts. He is the one that was over there holding the coats of the people that were ready to stone Stephen to death. That was Saul of Tarsus. Here he was, one that was trained in the ways of the Old Testament, one that was trained in the ways of the Greco-Roman world, and he was so for Judaism that he was willing to go around the country killing anyone who dared to be a Christian. If he were alive during modern times, he would be on Fox News and they would flash the word terrorist every time they mentioned Saul of Tarsus. But there was Saul of Tarsus going around persecuting the church. He was the one that authorized the stoning of Stephen. He is the one that went around and everyone knew that he was sort of the ringleader of the people that were killing Christians. But then something happened in Saul's life. Something changed Saul forever. Because as he was on the road to Damascus there in Acts chapter 9, as you'll remember, he saw the evidence that demanded he change his life. He saw the risen Lord speaking to him and he was told to go down to the preacher's house to find out what he had to do in order to become a Christian and how to live as a Christian, that great commission that Jesus had for him. But it was that Saul of Tarsus that saw the evidence and then had to change his life. It was a complete 180, wasn't it? You see, he was going this way, persecuting the church. He was going over here with all that he had, trying to extinguish Christianity. But then he saw the evidence. Then he saw the power of the gospel. Then he saw the reality of the gospel. And nothing was ever the same in Saul's life. From that point forward, he could no longer persecute the church. He had to preach the church. From that point forward, he could never put Jesus down. He had to exalt Christ in everything that he did. From that point forward, he could no longer try to kill Christians. From that point forward, he was only trying to build up Christians. You see, the gospel changed Saul. The gospel changed Saul so drastically that he left his family. He left all of the comforts of his life. He left everything that he had worked so diligently for, everything that he had been working for all of his life. He turned his back on it. He said, I count it as refuse. I count it as dung. All I want to know is Jesus Christ and him crucified. He said, I've left all of my former life behind. All I want to do is live so that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. That is all that Saul cared about because of the gospel. And you've seen similar changes in your own life, haven't you? You have seen individuals around you that have heard about Jesus and their life's never the same. You have seen individuals around you in your community that have learned the truth about Jesus and they have given up alcohol. They have given up their wild and riotous living. They have given up living for themselves. And they have decided, I can only live for Jesus. I can only now serve Him as my King. I can only now serve Him as my Lord. I can only now live for Him because of the power of the gospel. But we continue there in Romans chapter 1 and verse 1, and we go a little bit further, and we see that He's a servant. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. Now that word servant has to do with being a slave. 
You know, in the ancient world, there were actually more slaves than there were free people. And the slaves were treated uh, pretty well compared to what we think of as slavery. It's really not a one-to-one comparison. But they were completely at their master's, uh, at their master's decree. Whatever the master said, that's what had to go. And they completely depended upon their master. You see, the master was there to provide for them. That's why a lot of them sold themselves into slavery. And so you have a wonderful situation really for us to understand what it means to be a Christian. Because whenever Paul describes himself as a servant, a slave of Christ Jesus, he is saying that he is my master and I am entirely dependent on him. Now this is different for Paul, isn't it? Because you remember who Paul is, who he was rather. He was the one that was the up and coming guy in Judaism. He was the one that was living that life and he was going to be at the very top. He was the one that everyone looked to, but he threw it all away so that he could become a servant, so that he could be at the beck and call of Jesus. But it also tells us that he understood that his master would provide for him everything that he needed. Again, we look at the power of the gospel because we see that Jesus provides for us every single thing that we need. Every single request, every single spiritual need, every single physical need, everything that we care about, Jesus has promised that ultimately he will provide Jesus has promised that ultimately we should look to Him for every blessing in the heavenly places. So much so that the Bible tells us that we are to cast all of our anxieties upon Him because He cares for us. We cast all of our cares upon Him. All of the things that we are worried about, all of the things that concern us, all of the things that drive us crazy throughout the week, all of the things that we think we can control and we're really working hard to get in charge of, Jesus says, let me take care of it for you. Jesus says, let me hold that weight for you. Let me hold that burden for you for you because he is our master. You see, it's no wonder then that the gospel is so very attractive. It's no wonder then that we are so willing and eager to give up on everything in life just to be a Christian. It's no wonder then that we are willing to sacrifice our own desires, our own physical pursuits, our own lusts of this world our own striving for the things of this world because we understand who holds all things in His hand. And as we look to Him, as we turn to Him, and as we entrust our lives to Him, that becomes the greatest peace that we can ever know. The peace that surpasses all understanding, that peace of giving your life to the Master. But that's what the gospel can do, isn't it? That's what the gospel can do because it is upheld by Jesus. But we see here that Paul is a servant of Christ Jesus. Now that word Christ is again another very important word. It is the word that in the Old Testament is Messiah. And really it has to do with the king. Now, I know the Hebrew word means anointing, so the Greek word means anointing. But remember who was anointed in the Old Testament. It was the kings. It was the priests. It was the prophets on occasion. But especially the kings were anointed for that service, having the oil poured on them. Whenever Jesus is described as the Christ, the Messiah, He is the chosen messianic King. And whenever we look at Jesus through the lens of the gospel, then we can understand why we want him to be our Christ. Because that's the good news, that we serve King Jesus. Think of all the other things that you could be serving. 
Think of all of the other things that pull for your attention. Think of all of the other things that are trying to pull your life in one direction or another. And think about who's really king. Think about how frustrated we are in our own uh, government with the politics of our day, the politics of tomorrow, the politics of yesterday. Whoever's in charge, a lot of folks aren't going to like them. But thankfully, we serve King Jesus. And that brings us back to that word gospel, doesn't it? Because that word gospel was used in the ancient world, not just to describe good news, but it was really a political word as well. So that whenever individuals were about to be anointed the emperor, they were about to be anointed the king, they would issue how everything's going to be different. What life is going to be like now under my decree, under my reign, this is what things are going to be like. And they referred to that as their gospel. And so whenever we think about Jesus as king, it's important that we keep in mind the gospel. Because we now have a new reality because we're under a new administration. We're not under that old life. We're not under the things of this world. We're not not in bondage to sin. We're not slaves to the devil. We're not slaves to our own lust, our own desires. Instead, we are the servants of the king. And he has a new gospel for us. And when we look at the Sermon on the Mount, When we look at the sermon in Luke 6 and 7, and we see Jesus saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. We see Jesus saying, Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And then you look over in the Gospel of Luke, and you see a different sermon, I am convinced. But Jesus is using similar words and says, Blessed are the poor. He says, Blessed are those who mourn and weep. Why are they blessed? Because it's a new administration. There's a new order in town. There's a new life to be lived. You see, it is not just that we are to climb that ladder of blessedness and look at these beatitudes of ways that we are to try to be. It is those things, but there's more going on. Jesus is saying there is a new reality. And if you are meek and you pursue purity and you are pursuing holiness and righteousness, this is the way your life is going to be. You are going to be blessed. But if you pursue the things of the world, if you pursue everything this life is about, you're not going to be blessed. If you pursue all the things that the world tells you is going to make you great, you're going to find that it really is nothing. It really offers you very, very little. And at the end, you will find yourself incredibly disappointed because you gave your life to the wrong king, because you gave your life to the wrong Messiah. Because you gave your life to the wrong hope. Look at Jesus again, the king. And he says, my citizens of my kingdom, they live this way and they are truly, truly blessed. He is the Christ, but he is Christ Jesus. And that word Jesus is so very special to all of us, isn't it? As we say that word Jesus, it cannot help but conjure up emotions in us. It's one of those words that we cannot say without feeling. It's one of those words that means so much to us that whenever we say it, everything around us stops. And all we can do is think about Jesus. There's really not another word in all the English language like it is there. It's sort of the way whenever you are going somewhere, maybe you're going to a sporting event, you're coming in a little bit late and you hear the national anthem playing. You know what you do, don't you? You immediately stop, put your hand over your heart because of the respect of our country, the respect that that song deserves. Whenever you say that name Jesus, that's the way our heart is. That's the way our mind is. Everything simply stops. Because of Jesus. But why is that word so special? That word in the Hebrew language and in the Greek language as well means Savior. Salvation. Think about how great that is. That we have salvation. It's actually a medical term. 
And in uh, many of our text in the Old Testament that speak of Jesus, we are looking at Jesus healing and the words are actually talking about physical healing rather than spiritual healing. And so whenever Jesus comes into this world, you know what he does, right? He is all about spiritual healing, but he is also healing these people physically so that they can look back to their Old Testament and see that he bore our griefs and our sorrows. He bore our illnesses. He bore our pain. He took all of that upon himself. He took all of the curse of sin, all of the penalty of sin. Jesus bore it all so that we do not have to because he is our salvation. And that's why when we look to Jesus, we look to Him not only for things in the spiritual realm, but also in the physical. Because it is our Jesus who promised the physical resurrection, isn't it? It is our Jesus who by His life has lived life perfectly on our behalf. By His death has died death perfectly, bearing the wrath of God on our behalf. And it is Jesus whose body was put into the tomb. And it is Jesus who raised up from the dead on the third day on our behalf, the first fruits of the dead, so that we too can be raised. So that we can follow Him in His physical resurrection. So when we look at Jesus, we are looking at the salvation of our physical bodies, that it's going to be raised. That's what the word resurrection actually means. The word resurrection does not mean that we're just going to continue on as a disembodied spirit. Instead, it means that we're actually going to come up. And that's what we're promised, isn't it? The Bible doesn't it say that those who are in the grave shall hear His voice and come forth, those that have done good to the resurrection of life and those that have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. But He says you will come forth. This old body that wears out, this old body that decays, this old body that suffers with cancer and chronic illnesses and depression and all of the pains of life, this old body is going to be healed and Jesus is going to raise it. But that's not generally what we think about when we think about Jesus as our Savior. Generally what we think about when we think about Jesus as our Savior is that He has reconciled us to God. And that's important too, isn't it? That although we were in sin... We had all sinned and transgressed the law of God. We had fallen short of His glory. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. The Bible says that He is the propitiation or the atoning sacrifice for our sin. Now I know that word propitiation is one of those big Bible words that we kind of read it and then we go really quick because we don't really know what it means. We're not really sure how to say it. So we just move right along. It's one of the prettiest words in all the Bible. We can't miss it. That word propitiation has to do with a sacrifice that bears a penalty so that those who offer the sacrifice can go free. So when the Bible tells us that Jesus is the propiti propitiation of our sin, it is telling us that Jesus, as He hung on Calvary, bore the wrath of Almighty God so that we could be forgiven, so that we could go free, so that our sin could be atoned, so that our sin could be taken away. Jesus bore it all, and He has saved us through that sacrifice. That's why when we read in passages like Isaiah 53 that is expounded upon by Peter and 1 Peter and 2 Peter as well. Whenever we look there in Isaiah 53 and we see that He has borne our sin, that by His stripes we were healed, that He is the one that bore the wrath of God. And whenever He sees us go free, the Bible says that He rejoices in that. How can we not be moved? How can we not be challenged to live for the Lord? And how can we not be moved to fall in awe of our Savior, the one 
who carries our griefs and our sorrows. So every time that you see that word Jesus, you are reminded of that middle wall of separation, that middle wall of hostility that stood between us and God so that in His flesh He's torn it down so that we might go and have fellowship with God. It's a beautiful image, really. Because as you look back to the ancient temple of the Jews, you'll remember that there was that wall that went around the temple. And that wall separated where the Jews could go in and have a fellowship with God from where the Gentiles could be. You see, the Gentiles were stuck outside that wall. And we have found plaques that would have been on that wall telling the Gentiles that if you go anywhere past that wall, we will kill you and it's your own fault. That's the middle wall of hostility. That is that middle wall of division that separated the Gentile world from the fellowship with God. The Bible says Jesus tore it down. Not just for the Gentile world, but for sinners. For all of us. So that we might be brought into fellowship with God and be with Him forever. He is our Savior. He is our salvation. That's what the Apostle Paul saw there, isn't it? That's why he became a servant of Christ Jesus. But then we also see that he is called to be an apostle. He is called apostle. He is the one that has been set apart. Now Paul was special. You remember Jesus told the preacher whenever Paul, he was telling him he had to go convert, uh, he had to go baptize Saul. He was telling him that he has something planned for Saul to do. That there is a great work and he is going to have to preach to the Gentiles. He is going to have to suffer many things for my name. But he had a special work to do. But he was called by the gospel just like the rest of us. He looked at the evidence and he was given the opportunity either to accept it or to reject it just like we are. And so we read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14 that we are called by the gospel. Just like we're sitting here tonight and we're studying our Bibles together, just like we are thinking about Jesus, we are thinking about the Christ, we're thinking about the difference that the gospel has made in so many lives before and the difference that the gospel has made and will make in lives in the future. And we're thinking about our own life, we're thinking about ourselves, and the gospel is calling to us. Because we understand that we're not really living the way that we should. We understand that there are things in this world that are coming between us and Jesus. We understand there are things in this life that we are pursuing and Jesus has been forgotten. We understand there are things in this life that really are more important to us than the Lord Jesus Christ. We understand that in reality, we really think about Jesus very little and we really think about the world a whole lot because that's where our heart really is but the gospel still yet calls to us and we are called today by the power of the word we are called today by this message of Jesus to turn our life around like Paul did we are called today not to live like the world's living but instead to follow in the footsteps of Paul who gave up everything to be an apostle of Christ Jesus to be a servant of Christ Jesus we think about that word apostle. One who has been sent. It has that word postage right in the middle. Do you see it? He is called apostle. He is called to be sent. And that's what we are too. Because whenever we come to grips with the reality of the gospel, whenever the reality of the gospel hits us right between the eyes, you see, we've got to do something with it. We either have to run away from it or we have to run for it. We either have to run away from the Lord or we have to run with the Lord. You remember the story of Jonah, right? He, he tried to run ahead of God. He tried to run away from God and it just left him miserable. But whenever we see the gospel, we're not going to run away. We're, we're, we're not going to run away from the Lord. That's foolish. Instead, we're going to run to Him. We're going to run to that old rugged cross. 
We're going to run to that empty tomb and we're going to run to our hope of glory in heaven. That's what we're going to do, isn't it? Because we're called to be an apostle. Not to be one of the twelve, but you see, we're called to be on mission. Because this is the greatest news in the world. This is the greatest news the world could ever hear, is that Jesus has come. It is the greatest news in the world that Jesus has defeated sin, and that Jesus has defeated death. That's the greatest news. And that's what gives us life. And that's what we want to talk about, isn't it? The other day I was having a Bible study with a man. He's not able to read. He was just diagnosed with stage four cancer. He said, I want to know about Jesus. He said, I want to know that I'm going to be okay. The doctors have done all they could do. I want to know I can be okay. I got to talk to him about Jesus. No other news, no other story, no other name would have been as sweet except for the name of of Jesus. He obeyed the gospel Sunday night because of Jesus. And this man has hope because of Jesus. That's the reason we have hope. But it's also what we have to share with others because the world is sick and the world is dying and the world needs hope. Whenever you turn on the news, you see the need for the gospel, don't you? Whenever you see all of the horrible things going on and you hear that it's going to be even worse at 10 o'clock when the news comes on again, it needs the gospel. Whenever your friends call you and their marriage is in trouble, whenever your friends call you and their children are in trouble, whenever you have to call home and talk to mama and daddy, what you need is the gospel. What you need is Jesus. Let's not run from that message. Let's not run from it, but instead let us run to it and point others to the way. And then finally we see that the Apostle Paul, he wasn't just one sent out an apostle, but he was also one set apart. One set apart for the gospel of God. He was different. He was not the way that he used to be. Coincidentally, whenever we look at this word for set apart, it's very interesting to me because the word Pharisee, and if we were to associate Paul with any religious group in, among the Jews, I believe it would have been the Pharisees because they were zealous for the law and there was a group of them that went around trying to free the Israelites from the Roman oppressors and they were always studying the Bible. They were always studying God's Word, trying to do everything just right and they wanted to be certain that they didn't mess up and that nobody else messed up either. And so whenever we think about Paul, I think we have to think about Paul as a Pharisee perhaps. But that word Pharisee, it means to be separated. It means to be set apart. And so when Paul says that he is set apart for the gospel of God, he says, now I am a Pharisee for the gospel. That zeal that I had before, whenever I said to the world, I want you to live for the Lord. I want to live for the Lord. I want to pursue God in holiness. I want to do everything according to the plan. I want to be pleasing to my God as best I can. I want to reform the religious views around me. Whenever Paul said that he was a Pharisee in Judaism, now he says, I'm set apart for the gospel of God. Now I am different. Now I've been changed because I know Jesus. Because I've seen the evidence for the gospel. I'm not going to live that way anymore. Instead, everything is poured out for my Lord because He is set apart for the gospel of God. Are you set apart tonight? You think about what it means to be set apart. It means to be different, doesn't it? It means that, that you're, you're recognized as being different. Everybody around you recognizes that there's, there's something else going on here. They recognize that you're living a different way, that your eyes are pointed toward a different goal, that your life is oriented different than everyone else because you are separated. I used to, uh, you all know I love my fried chicken. And, and You remember when you used to get a bucket of fried chicken from KFC? And you could get different kinds of chicken. Y'all remember that? Because there's different flavors of fried chicken if you didn't know. 
But you could dip different kinds of fried chicken and they would put it in the bucket. But in the bucket, they would have that divider and they would have the original recipe in one corner and they'd have another recipe over in another corner. And then over here on this other side of the bucket, they would have another kind of chicken. You see, it was separated and they had that divider there. That's what the gospel does for us is it separates us from the world. It keeps us set apart from the world. It keeps us different. It keeps us living the way that we should. It keeps us focused on different things rather than the things of this life because we're separated. But we're separated from the gospel of God. And I think we see another thing here. Because whenever we're separated from the gospel of God, we become a part of the church. And really, if we want to look at the world... It can be divided into those that are in Christ, those who are in the church, and those who are outside the church. Now, for those who are inside the church, you are united to Christ. You are united to Him. You are a part of His body. So we see in Romans chapter 6 that you have been buried with Him in baptism, that you have been united with Him in a death like His, therefore you'll be raised with Him in a resurrection like His. We see in Galatians 3 that we are baptized into Christ Jesus. So whenever we are baptized, we are put into the body of Christ. We're different now. But I want you to think about why that's so important. Because as we've been looking at the gospel of Christ, we need to remember what all happened in the gospel of Christ. We go all the way back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we can look at Jesus and what he is doing in this world. What is he doing? He's doing everything perfectly. Especially in the gospel of Matthew, we see that Jesus is reliving many of the major events of the ancient Israelites. And so he is baptized there in the Jordan River. He is led out by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. And then after he has been tempted for those 40 days instead of 40 years, you remember that in the Gospel of Matthew, it's immediately followed by Jesus giving the Sermon on the Mount. And that correlates to what? To the giving of the law. And so everything in the Gospel of Matthew fits in with the major events of the Old Testament. And then in Matthew 13, we understand, we see there, there is this section of wise sayings. And so it's not just the life of the Old Testament people, but in fact, the Gospel of Matthew mirrors the Old Testament books as they are in the Hebrew order. You start out there in the beginning. You go through and you see the books of Moses. You see there in the middle the wisdom literature. And then at the end, you see that they are looking into Canaan's land and ready to go in. Everything about their life that they had messed up, everything about their life that they had gotten wrong, Matthew presents Jesus as doing it all right. He fixed everything that they messed up. Do you have somebody in your life like that? You know, whenever I try to do stuff at the house, I, I, I make a big mess of it. <laughs> Sophie won't even let me cook anymore. She, she has to do it. And that's kind of on purpose. See, I'm a lot smarter than you think I am. <laughs> but they take care of it, right? I can make the biggest mess and they'll fix it, make it just right. That's what Jesus did. Everything that they messed up, Jesus did it perfectly. You know what that tells us? All of our mistakes, everything that we've messed up, Jesus fixes that too. Just the other day, I was talking to a man that was worried to death about imperfection in his own life, worried to death about imperfection in his kids' lives. I said, hey, you forgot about Jesus. You forgot about Jesus. He's already lived life perfectly for us. That's the gospel. Remember that you are a part of the body of Christ. So that that perfection is now reckoned unto you. And when God looks at us, He looks at us through that lens of perfection that is Jesus. 
That's incredible, isn't it? Because I know my mistakes, I know my sin, I know my faults, just like you do. But when the Father looks at us, He looks at us through that lens of Jesus. And He sees His perfection. But Jesus not only lived that perfect life for us, Jesus also died that perfect death for us. Just as is appointed to all men once to die and then the judgment. One day or another we're all going to die and we're all going to be laid in a tomb. We're all going to be buried in some form or fashion. But that's not the end. And I'm so thankful that whenever I stand there at the cemetery, and I'm standing there by the open grave and looking at a widow, looking at parents that have lost their child, looking at a husband that's lost his wife. I'm so thankful that Jesus has already been there and done that. He has already conquered the grave. He has already defeated death because He defeated sin. And I can offer hope because of the gospel in the name of Jesus. And I'm so glad that tonight I can look you in the eye and tell you that you can have hope. That you can have life. That you can be different tonight than you were today because of the gospel. So are you a Christian tonight? Are you in Christ where all of the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places are? Are you in Christ, the Son, the Beloved, the One whom from eternity past God the Father has been pouring out His love upon the Son? Are you in the body of Christ? Because if you are, then God is pouring out His love upon you just as sure as He is pouring out His love upon the Son. Are you in Christ? Are you a Christian? Do you need to make a change? Because we've been looking at the gospel all night. We've seen how it changed Saul. What change do you need to make? How do you need to be different? How does your life need to be different now than it was five minutes ago? How does your relationships need to change now as opposed to what they were ten minutes ago? How does your family need to be different now than it was whenever you had supper just a little while ago? How are you going to be different? How are you going to be more like Jesus because you have been encountered with the gospel? What's it going to be? How are we going to go forward? It's really important that you answer this question. Because the Bible tells us that when Jesus comes again, He will come in flaming fire with His holy angels, taking vengeance on those that do not know God and those who do not Obey the gospel. Have you obeyed the gospel? Have you been buried with Christ in baptism? Do you now walk in newness of life? Are you a Christian? If you're not, the Bible has told us what's going to happen. We know what it's like to run away from God like Jonah. We know that it is promised that Jesus Himself will come with His holy angels and take vengeance of God, the wrath of God out on you forever and forever if you do not obey the gospel. You have that opportunity tonight though. You have that opportunity to become a Christian. You have that opportunity to be saved. You have that opportunity to be changed by the gospel. You have that opportunity to come to Jesus tonight. So won't you come? He's waiting. Won't you come? That's why Jesus died won't you come? That's why Jesus lives ever making intercession for the saints. Won't you come? That's why Jesus is coming back so that He can bring you home. So why not now? Won't you come as together we stand and sing?